Here. All yours. What's all good in you? It's been three years since the spectacular launch of Cyberpunk 2077. It's something that practically no one can forget and feels happened closer than in reality because of its absurdity. The bug compilations, the crashes, Cat's survival, and even PlayStation Store's removal of the game. I hate to admit it, but looking back at the past, I kind of feel nostalgic of the whole situation, especially considering all the other things that were happening in the world during the time. But nevertheless, in the moment, it was devastating, not only for me, but for the vast majority. Looking at how a developer who was a favorite, and one which created such brilliant and beautiful experiences, could fall so low with a single release. In fact, I myself was a backer of 2077 because of my admiration of The Witcher 3, and it wasn't easy to accept such a depressing release after playing such a formidable experience. Today it is 2024, and even though some things remain the same, the state around Cyberpunk 2077 is completely different. The game has not only been through deep rehabilitation, but the game has garnered a vast and ever-growing fanbase through the support of many different clever mediums, such as the anime, Edgerunners. I myself also pulled the trigger and recently visited the game on the release of the Phantom Liberty DLC. Of course, after three long years and with the still present heavy disappointment of the initial release. And if I'm being honest, I loved almost every single second of it. During my recent playthrough, which has stretched over 80 hours now, I can confidently say I love this game. I love its dystopian world. I love its almost unbeatable immersion. I love its characters and narratives. I love its conflicting themes and messages. And I love Night City and the strong, repulsive character and feeling it holds. I'm sure most of you can agree that there's nothing quite like it, but yet, the more I analyze, the more I reflect on my experiences, and the more I look back on what the true potential that was advertised for this world, the more I feel like I shouldn't love this game so much. See, the hard and somewhat bitter truth to this day is that despite the years of fixing and transformation, Cyberpunk 2077 is still a shallow version of its potential and marketing. And as beautiful and teamfully striking the game may be, it is still situated more inside of a gallery than an actual living, breathing world of an RPG. It's still built on a lie, and one which I feel guilty for loving. Let's start from the top, the still inconsequential world that is Night City. Cyberpunk 2077's story is somewhat of a masterpiece, I think we can all agree on that. In my first playthrough, mainly due to the distracting performance issues and bugs, I never paid full attention to how much love and care has been given to the core narrative inside of this game. It not only contains fantastic characters and bonding, but also a plot that pays off very well at the end. It's a story that I undoubtedly enjoyed and became connected to, to the point where some of my conversations with Johnny are still stuck in my head. It is a very well written and executed narrative. But my problem isn't with the writing or the quality of the storytelling here, it's rather with how little it relates back to what it's supposed to be, to what it was promised to be. A generational defining role playing game with a world of countless possibility and choice. For those who have played CD Projekt Red's predecessor, The Witcher 3, I want you to remember the narratives you experienced inside that game. And not only, but also how consequential and significant they felt through a personal and world lens. Geralt wasn't only a mere third person character that you played as, but through the vast amounts of choice and consequence was a direct blend in between you and his own core personality. 
This not only made you feel directly present inside the world, but also helped every playthrough feel majorly different, as you try to view every consequence of every choice and option to see the different manners the world could change depending on what you choose, because it all actually mattered. It was so significant that there's dozens of channels sprouted across YouTube to test this very purpose. So, how is this reciprocated inside of Cyberpunk 2077? Well, that's the thing. It's not. Let's view the very first choice you make in 2077. The life path selection. Here, you're given three unique life paths to choose from. Corpo, Street Kid, and Nomad. These three choices were originally advertised to create a drastic impact on the narrative and the character of your V. Not only that, they would offer you additional choices and routes that would lead to scenarios and consequences completely impossible in the other corresponding backgrounds. So, is this the case in the game now? Does picking Corpo lead you down a different route than a Nomad? Does the game give different privileges and meaningful choices to these life paths? Most importantly, does the game actually feel different? No, not really. See, no matter which life path you pick, after the initial 15 minutes intro, you will always end up at the exact same point, the exact same cutscene, and the exact same story beat with Jackie. The selections are completely meaningless because you'll always just end up becoming the same Merc. Sure, you do continue getting small dialogue prompts here and there for your set background, and even one exclusive side mission for each, but all they are is just filler. There's no real drastic effect or consequences they carry. This problem only gets worse when you realize that it is not just your life path, but the majority of the choices in the entire duration of the game. For instance, view the entire first chapter, from the very start to the heist. There is in fact not a single possible choice you can make that is able to alter the trajectory of the story in any way whatsoever. The heist will always go wrong, Subaru will always die, and X will be uh, disposed of. 2077 was originally advertised and meant to triumph over The Witcher 3 in agency and consequence, but it does the complete opposite even to this day. Inside The Witcher 3, for instance, even during one of the very first quests you obtain, the one which leads you to the Bloody Baron, had so many unique and actual consequential choices to pick from that would not only heavily alter the ending of that specific quest, but also the entirety of the game. You could have two people playing through that quest and not even be able to relate with what they experience. This is the beauty of The Witcher 3, and what makes it the best video game I've ever played. There was not a single quest in that game which didn't offer some sort of long and short-term consequence for not only Geralt, but the whole world. Every time I had to make a decision or choice inside dialogue, I didn't just fluke it and pick a random one, I genuinely observed and critiqued each option before I touched any, as I knew the risk and consequence they possibly held. My favorite example of this is during one of the narrative set pieces inside that same Bloody Baron quest on the Vispering Hillhawk. Here, Geralt is sent to confront a tree with his spirit inside its roots, and I'm not going to get too much into the details, but practically the game gives you three choices. Start the ritual, trick the tree, or straight up just kill it. Now, for those who have played The Witcher 3, you know the absolute distinct and morally great consequences each of these options can cause, which are not only short term, but also stretch out to the ending of the game. Let's also not forget that The Witcher 3 is almost 3 to 4 times in total length than Cyberpunk 2077 as well, and yet still manages to pull off many more alternate realities for quests based off of your decisions. Phantom Liberty attempted to resolve a great many of these issues, and it actually does. The choices in the DLC carry actual consequences and real effect. And I'd even go as far as saying the DLC is superior than the main story in possibly every single way. It's something I do commend CD Projekt Red for trying, but once again, at times it still feels far too safe. For example, why wasn't there a possible option to save Aurora and Aimeric? Why do all the actual choices, such as siding with Reed or Songbird, come at the very end, which can be quickly reloaded through a quicksave, 
Why is the game so allergic to organically developing relationships where the whole of your interaction and choice and dialogue with them is put through full effect. In both Phantom Liberty and the base game, it's not until the very very end where you do start getting some genuine and drastic choices to make in the world. But at that point, since it's the end, the novelty of experiencing drawn out long term consequences disappears. The only risk present anymore is a simple clear cut option to modify the immediate ending, which could also easily be rolled back by a quick save. It kind of reminds me of how Red Dead Redemption 2 dealt with its choices through the ending, where the major choices, the one that actually made an impact and could change Arthur's fate, were only present during the last chapter of the game. But the thing is, Red Dead 2 was not marketed as an RPG, nor was it trying to be one, whereas it's the opposite for 2077. Many argue that the true role-playing elements in 2077 are inside the side quests, that the true beauty of seeing consequences for your actions are found through the many different mini-narratives scattered across the city. And sure, I can get behind that. It is true that the side stories actually possess far more routes and meaningful choices than the main story itself. This is also why I find myself more engaged with the random stories that I stumble upon rather than the almost never ending straight cut dialogue in the main story. However, after a while of doing these, you also slowly realize another big problem. You realize how motionless this city really is. How little it changes despite whatever you do. For example, take a look at the I Fought the Law side quest. It was a very well made quest with good characters, a good antagonist, meaningful choices, and a sort of shade of grey behind everything. At the end, you could tell Jefferson and Elizabeth the truth about the death of the deceased Mayor Ryan, or you could hide it from them. But with either choice, I was curious about the long term consequences that might follow. How Night City itself could change, what could happen to the characters in a long term perspective, and how their trajectory would transform. But then, after you pick your final choice and leave the building, nothing. No codex entry, no new information sent to you even after dozens of days, and overall, even though there may be a consequence in the future, it is never played out in the game. Sure, there's another side quest with them named Dream On which you will obtain after a few days upon the completion of the first one. But not only does this Dream On quest relate back very little to your choices in the first quest, but also shares practically the same problems. These problems plague almost every interaction you will have with Night City. No matter how much your street reputation rises or what choices you may decide upon, you never actually feel as though V is influencing really anything. Something that Cyberpunk 2077 does a phenomenal job with is the political commentary of the world. If that's from the broadcasts you see while inside elevators, or even the ads scattered like wildflies across almost every building, the game not only just captures that feeling of living inside a corporate hellish dystopia, but also grounds you into something that could be a possible reality, even in our world. However, we come back to the same issues I was talking about before. From the start to the finish, nothing ever changes inside Night City. To get out of V's apartment, there is an elevator. Inside this elevator, there is always some type of television playing. If that's a news channel showcasing the different events happening worldwide, or a talk show interviewing influential figures. Initially, I saw these and was captivated. They not only helped with immersing oneself further into the world, but also helped with understanding this universe better, how this alternate reality really functioned. Near the middle of the game, I hopped into the elevator another time to go back up to my apartment, and as that was happening, I noticed that something awfully familiar was playing on the television. An interview with the NCPD spokeswoman. I thought to myself, haven't I already watched this? And I did, at the very beginning actually, before the moments I found Jackie eating at a stall. By the end of the game, I believe I was bombarded with this exact same interview almost 15 times. It completely breaks any immersion that's there. Furthermore, it's not just this interview, but practically every other type of media present in the game. Remember, Night City here is not stuck in some time pause. 
It's supposed to be a breathing, living, and moving juggernaut. However, no matter what happens in the world, no matter what choices you pick to influence it, and no matter what you do, Night City will always be static and unresponsive, at least while you're there, because the worst part is, is that a majority of the endings change Night City's trajectory pretty heavily. But guess what? You'll never experience that change because the game fucking ends. This lack of variability and volatility in the world building continues to be apparent throughout the entirety of the game, with the lack of variety in advertisements, the same NCPD dispatcher calls or missions that will repeat over the exact same areas, and a lack of any real-time events or celebrations that even GTA V, a 10-year-old game, was able to accomplish. See, this supposed always-changing Night City is awfully stagnant and your choices as V really are fake and more so make you imagine what could happen rather than the game actually playing it out. Funnily, the whole main plotline of V's slow approaching death, thanks to the relic, has made it very hard for CD Projekt Red themselves to show Night City in a meaningful, timely manner that showcases its evolution. Even Johnny's flashbacks could have been a great opportunity to showcase the way this alternate universe has progressed and evolved. But nope, exactly nothing changed in that sequence except for a 2023 poster covered around with fog. I haven't even mentioned the still lifeless NPCs that all look the same and walk back and forth, or the many features that were removed such as wall running and the deep and intricate internet system that CD Projekt Red was bragging about so much before release. Because honestly, I really don't care about small gimmicks such as that. I couldn't care less if an NPC had a shedding schedule or if every building has to be enterable with a usable public toilet, but what I do care about, especially when there's a RPG tag on the game, is a world that actually feels alive, that actually feels as though it is erratic and variable, that actually feels as though it is moving in time and most importantly that actually feels as though your decisions and choices can have influence upon it. CD Projekt Red completely redefined the RPG genre with the release of The Witcher 3, so much so that even giant franchises like Assassin's Creed wanted to cheaply cash in on its wide success. That only makes it more painful for me to see just how these wheels have turned. In fact, I believe the reason why I continue to love 2077 despite the fact that it is still somewhat of a lie isn't really ironically because of the game itself, but more because of the universe, the cyberpunk world. When I imagine Cyberpunk 2077, I do not imagine shooting people up or my very immersive interactions with the world. I imagine Night City. I imagine the concept of what it takes place in. I imagine the setting of the game itself and what that potential of that setting is. There's no game that tackles world themes to an extent that 2077 does. I mean, there's a million fantasy medieval RPGs out there, there's a million survival RPGs, but how many RPGs are there which let you travel into a dystopian future in such an interesting universe? It's a unique experience, which is why so many people, including me, find it so admirable. However, removing all the rose-tinted glasses and love for the universe itself, as a standalone RPG, I still feel as though the game continues to stand extremely mediocre. Especially when you've played crazily interwoven games like Baldur's Gate 3 where a choice you make at the beginning could completely warp the entire ending of the game, it's hard for me not to feel as though we were ripped off with the supposedly genre-defining RPG mechanics that we ended up getting in 2077. I did not make this video to unnecessarily bash the game or to undermine the effort CD Projekt Red has put towards a project to make it redeemable. I made this to highlight that what we have today, even though it may be great, is not even close to what it was meant to be. I feel as though a great many people do not understand the consequences of delivering such a overhyped and underwhelming product, especially when I see videos like this, or this, or this. I hate these not because of their genuine affection that they might portray, but because of their genuine ignorance. 
They have no idea what they are talking about and probably don't even understand the consequences 2077 as a whole has had on the AAA gaming industry. The whole fiasco has proved to publishers that it doesn't matter if you push out a watery turd as long as you build enough excitement and hype around it, only to fix it years later. Look, I love Cyberpunk 2077, but I love its potential more. I love what it could be more than what it is, and I hate the lies more than I love the good. It is such a weird experience I've played which always has me conflicted, because if you remove CD Projekt Red, the lies, the marketing, and even the name itself, you would find an objectively very good action-adventure semi-linear title. But once you add those things back, I struggle to not find it a deception, one which I feel guilty for liking. I want Cyberpunk Orion or whatever it's going to be called to achieve that potential, to achieve its promise of being a true genre-defining RPG, to achieve a world that feels alive and moving as it was originally advertised, and most importantly, to achieve the original vision the developers set out upon. Because after all, 2077 is a lie, a lie which I continue to love, but a lie nonetheless.